energizing. This presentation takes place at the Berkeley Fellowship of Unitarian Universalist Fellowship Hall, located at 1924 Cedar Street in Berkeley. This is a benefit for the Berkeley Fellowship of Unitarian Universalists. This event is wheelchair accessible, and for more information, call 510-333-6097. You are tuned to KPFA, KPFB, Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. Stay tuned. It's 8 a.m. and time for the morning mix. Welcome to the Morning Mix. This is the Project Sensor Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Peter Phillips in studio with Andy Lee Roth. Mickey Hoff is taking the day off traveling with his family. Today's program will address the issue of the continuing increasing costs and difficulties of a college education in the U.S. and how students and faculty are fighting back. For the first half of the show, we'll interview Adam Bessie on the Orwellian student success fees at the California State University. And we'll also bring in... Victor Garland, Professor Emeritus from Soma State University, and how the SSU President Ruben Armagnana tried to bring new student fees to campus in 1996 and was challenged by Mario Savio and defeated 2-1 to one by a student vote. For the second half of the show, we'll hear from Sonoma State University students on their recent victory over another attempt by the same president to impose a new $500 fee. But first, the KPFA news headlines. Please stay with us. I'm Eileen Alfandari with news headlines. Ousted Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych appeared in public for the first time since he fled from Ukraine to Russia. Speaking from a southern Russian city, Yanukovych said he would not give up the fight for his country's future. If remarks were translated on Al Jazeera English television. Nobody overthrew me. Nobody overthrew me. I was forced to leave the Ukraine under the immediate threat to my life and life of my uh, family. As you know, in Ukraine, the authorities were seized, the power was seized by the nationalist, pro-fascist uh, uh, people, the gangsters, who are the minority of the people of the Ukraine, they represent the minority of the people of the Ukraine. Armed men are in control of two airports in the ethnic Russian Crimea region. They wore no identifiable uniforms. Ukraine's new leadership described it as an invasion and occupation by Russian forces. Russia denied its forces were involved in at least one of the seizures. Unconfirmed reports said eight Russian military helicopters had arrived in the Crimean city of Sevastopol. The new prime minister, Arseniy Yatsenyuk, said Ukraine hoped to begin receiving international aid soon and was determined to fulfill conditions needed for international monetary fund support. A previous deal collapsed after Ukraine failed to implement IMF demands for lower gas subsidies, which would have hurt Ukrainians by pushing up energy prices sharply. The IMF is likely to demand harsh austerity measures in exchange for its support. California Governor Jerry Brown formally launched his re-election campaign. He announced his intentions with a written statement posted on his website with an accompanying tweet. The 75-year-old Democrat said he had filed the required paperwork to seek office and was ready to deal with a raft of pressing issues from the devastating drought to a pension system mired in long-term debt. The announcement was expected. Brown has been stockpiling campaign cash for months. He has nearly $17 million for the race, far more than any of his Republican rivals. They include former U.S. Treasury official Neil Kashkari and Tea Party Republican Assemblyman Tim Donnelly. BART board members seemed unlikely to move forward with a plan to put advisory measures on the November ballot that would urge state lawmakers to ban strikes by BART workers. BART board president Joel Keller is pushing the plan in the wake of last year's BART strikes. Rather than um, the employees stopping work, uh, which impacts on 
not only our employees and commuters in this region, it is a devastating, has a devastating impact on the, um, on, on the economy and, and commute of the Bay Area. So the proposal is, um, that, uh, instead of, uh, instead of going to, um, uh, going on strike, that the uh, labor co- contracts disputes will be, dis- be submitted to an arbitration board. Fellow BART board member Rebecca Saltzman said it was a bad idea and risked inflaming relations between BART and its workers all over again. I hope you understand how divisive. I think if we go forward with this measure, it would jeopardize positive efforts and, and also jeopardize our efforts to regain confidence of the public. It would be a very divisive battle, and not just within BART, but outside of BART, too. Steve Franklin, an attorney for SCIU Local 10 to 1, also spoke out against Keller's plan to ban BART strikes. I hope you understand how divisive this proposal could be. At a time when labor peace is assured for four years and the unions in BART could be putting their recent dispute behind them, Uh, This proposal threatens to provoke another year of turmoil and division. This is an attempt to roll back rights that have been won through a long course of struggle. It violates traditions of California law and international labor standards. Keller's plan would put advisory measures on the ballot in the counties of Alameda, Contra Costa, and San Francisco. The BART board took no action on his proposal at last night's meeting. Keller said he'll bring up his proposal again. Google has announced it will grant $6.8 million to fund two years of free travel on San Francisco's Muni system for low- and middle-income youth. Muni already had a pilot program underway for free transit for San Francisco youth and has been discussing whether and how to extend it. Google's gift comes as protesters have targeted Google buses as a symbol of gentrification and evictions making the city unaffordable to those who already live there. Protesters have blocked Google buses that transport tech workers from San Francisco to the sprawling campus in Mountain View. San Francisco Mayor Ed Lee welcomed the donation and said he hopes it will be the first in a series of such gifts. A group of current and former students at UC Berkeley have filed a federal complaint against the school over how it handles sexual assaults. The group is claiming the university violated federal anti-discrimination laws by failing to protect them from sexual harassment and assault. Senate Republicans blocked Democratic legislation that would have provided $21 billion for medical education and job training benefits for the nation's veterans. The bill fell victim to election year disputes over spending and fresh sanctions against Iran. Republicans used a procedural move to block the bill after Senate Veteran Affairs Committee Chair Bernie Sanders Bernie Sanders chided Republican lawmakers about their priorities. You are prepared to vote, and virtually all Republicans are, to give millionaires and billionaire families, the wealthiest of the wealthy, top three-tenths of one percent, $100 billion in tax breaks, but we are not prepared. We supposedly don't have the money to get VA health care for somebody making $28,000, $30,000. The vote sidetracking the bill was 56 to 41, supporters falling four votes short of the 60 they needed to prevail. Weather forecast for the San Francisco Bay Area rain, a slight chance of thunderstorms, highs in the upper 50s in Fresno and the central San Joaquin Valley, showers a chance of thunderstorms, highs 59 to 64. I'm Eileen Alfandari. I'll have more news at noon. Please join us at 6 for the Pacifica Evening News. Welcome back to the Morning Mix. This is the Project Censored Show. I'm Peter Phillips in studio with Andy Lee Roth. Today's program will address the issue of the continuing increasing cost of difficulties of a college education in the United States and how students and faculty are fighting back. First, we'll interview Adam Bessie on the Orwellian terminologies used in media and education. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me. And we'll also talk to Victor Garland, Professor Emeritus from Sonoma State University. And thank you, Peter. Thank you for inviting me. Andy Roth here, uh, and Adam Bessie is Professor of English at Diablo Valley College. Mm -hmm. He's published essays on education, media, and culture in the Washington Post's answer sheet. 
He's been a regular contributor to the Daily Censored Online and, of course, the Project Censored ongoing book series. But the project he's been working on over the past two years, published at Truthout Online, is a, a series of entries of graphic journalism on education. Mm -hmm. This two-year project has been examining the privatization, the standardization, and technicalization of public education and how people are fighting back. But Adam, before we turn to those specific topics, I wonder if you could say just a little bit about what it, what it is to do graphic journalism and uh, how is this different from, say, political cartoons? It's a great question. First of all, it's so hard to describe what we're doing because the word graphic, you start thinking we're talking about sexual journalism or something, or it's going to be violent, right, or there are going to be superheroes in it or something. So we haven't really come up with a good word for, word for what we're doing. But basically what it is is using pictures and words to tell a story. It's a medium, just like you can have a radio documentary, you can have a comics documentary. Again, the word comics is problematic because it implies it's going to be funny. And none of the comics that I've made are particularly funny. They're simply using illustrations and words to communicate a message, just again as you would on radio, just as you would in a doc film documentary or photojournalism. So it's just graphic journalism, illustrations and words together. And so the, what we're talking about here, this three-part series, the, the most recent of which is This School is Not a Pipe, but the series begins with the disaster capitalism curriculum, the high price of education reform in the United States, which Dan Archer illustrated and Adam Bessie did the text for. Uh, and that appeared uh, as that itself was a three-part series looking at uh, the high price of education reform in Washington, D.C., New Orleans and Finland. Yeah. And then the second part, if I'm right, is the automated teaching machine. Yeah, and that's about automation and teaching. I know that's hard to believe. In the first industrial revolution, right, we know in the 1850s, they automated physical labor, correct? Now we're what, in what Kurt Vonnegut in his book Player Piano from the 1850s uh, calls the second and third industrial revolutions where the work of the mind is becoming automated. And so I came across this actually in the automated teaching machine, which I did with Arthur King, who's an illustrator and teacher, D art teacher at DVC, uh, from my experience working in the Learning Center, which is our English second language program and our basic skills program. And we had an assessment to look at student work for years that was read by adjunct and full-time instructors, and we'd sit and we'd read their work and then figure out how to play students. This is a very common practice. About three years ago, in the middle of the budget crisis, of course, right, they, it was said, well, this is too expensive. And I'm not critiquing our administration because we really were running out of, we really had financial problems. And this assessment is very expensive. This wasn't a critique of our school at all. This was part of the disaster capitalism curriculum. The budgets on our colleges and public systems are being destroyed. We don't have money. We've still got to make things get done. We still have to assess students and place them into classes. It has to happen. We didn't have the money. So along comes the College Board. This is a nonprofit um, corporation, and they have a program called AccuPlacer. And AccuPlacer can read student essays. And this was shocking to me. It's a computer program that has an algorithm that can read student essays. And believe it or not, our homegrown human assessment was corporate outsourced to AccuPlacer. And now that's where it is because it was half the price for the same level of work, right? In much the same way as at the 19th century and the turn of the 20th century, you have these hand workers being put out of business by the work of the machine that could do more for the same. It was more efficient. So that inspired me to look into automation and teaching. And this report, Automated Teaching Machine, looks into, this is just the beginning. In South Korea, there's actually an English teaching robot. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> it's called Inky. And you can look it up online, there's a video. And it, it teaches pronunciation and language. It costs $8,000. How much does a human teacher cost? Well, you've got to pay their living wage. You've got to pay their health insurance, whatever else, housing. So you can see that the logic of the market and the, large, the logic of business, this is just this automation is sort of symbolic of business and industrial interests taking over and framing how education should operate.
You're listening to the Project Censored Show. I'm Andy Lee Roth in studio with co-host Peter Phillips, and we're hearing from Adam Bessie, professor of English at Diablo Valley College and the author of the latest publication, the latest uh, installment in his uh, two-year project on education, the latest being This School is Not a Pipe. Previous installments in this series have been written up in the Chronicle of Higher Education, Mm -hmm. and they can be found online at truthout.org. Org. So, Adam, tell us a little bit then about the latest installment, This School is Not a Pipe. Who did you collaborate with, and what's the primary message in this installment? The, this latest project was done with Josh Neufeld, who I was very excited to work with. He is a New York Times bestselling author of a graphic journalistic work called New Orleans A.D., which was a, a graphic history of New Orleans actually witnessed by the people that lived there. And so I was very excited to work with them on this. And This School is Not a Pipe. It's a reference to Magritte, that painting, this is not a pipe, which is a picture, which is a picture of a pipe. And the whole graphic essay is a meditation on the images and languages and metaphors we use to think about education. Where, where it was inspired from is I went to a conference in Los Angeles as part of my job in the community college. And in one presentation, uh, a professor at a college used the phrase pipeline leakage. Pipeline leakage. And I said, well, am I in like a plumbing conference? Did I walk into the wrong room? What is he talking about? So I asked, I don't know what this phrase means, pipeline leakage. And he said, oh, that's referring to students dropping out of school. I said, so you're saying pipeline leakage is referring to students dropping out of classes? Yes. So this just infuriated me. I said, this is an Orwellian euphemism where human beings are being looked at as leakage. It's so distancing. It's sort of like in war, collateral damage. Uh, You can think of numerous war euphemisms that distance oneself from the actual human cost of things. And then I started looking into this metaphor more of pipeline leakage. And, And it wasn't just this one professor. Indeed, it goes all the way to the top of the Obama administration where they have a signature program called the Cradle to career pipeline. They use this phrase over and over again, the cradle to career pipeline. I want you just to stop and listeners to think about this for a second, a pipeline. I have a two-year-old son, and as I show him the comic, I sure as heck don't want my son in a pipe. It's constricting. I imagine it'd be kind of slimy. What other kind of gunk is in a pipe? Also, there's no choice there. You're in a pipe. You have to move along this sort of standard pipe length. What happens to a kid that doesn't fit into this standard size of pipe? Where do they go? What happens? And so I noticed that this language was hegemonic. It was normalizing. And it showed that we think of school as sort of a mechanical entity. And so I said, this is, this is not the way I want to teach. And this is not where I, the kind of system I want my child to grow up in. So I was able to interview William Ayers, who's a prominent educator, first and foremost, despite things that people have said about him in connection to Obama, and Diane Ravitch, who's one of my friends, who's also a prominent educator, and they both very much disagree with this idea that we're in a pipeline. And so I wanted to see what are other ways we can imagine what education could be. And when you look at, again, this idea of this school is not a pipe, it sounds just like metaphor poetry, and I am a language teacher. But the more that we use phrases like this is a pipeline or pipeline leakage, the more we actually create policies that reflect this language reality and the more that it doesn't seem strange to automate things, for example, right? So if if school is an industry, if it's a pipeline, then, well, it makes a lot of sense to have robots in there. It makes a lot of sense to use part-time adjunct labor. It makes a lot of sense to have to have standardized tests because we have to get people through the pipeline. But what if, like Diane Ravitch said, we think of public education as a family endeavor. A lot of these policies start to look unappealing. So I'm not saying that we should look at school as a family or as a journey, as William Ayers says, but we need to widen the metaphors and the language that we use in talking about education so we have more humane policies that treat our children and our students as human beings and not and not as raw or to be processed. Mm-hmm. Well, Adam, I'd like to to reflect on the what I call the neoliberal approach to higher education, which literally has been around for the last 40 years. And what's that meant is increasing costs to our students, uh, where the California State Universities used to be free. Uh, it's now in, ranging from seven to $8,000 a year for fees, uh, sometimes even higher. 
And, uh, of course, that doesn't cover, you know, the expenses for living and uh, or if you're staying in a dorm, $10,000 a year for food and housing. I mean, so, you know, you're talking about a public college yeah. now costing $80,000 for, for someone to go, students ending up in massive debt, trillion dollars worth of debt on the backs of students now in the country, and, of course, increased class size for faculty. Uh, and in addition, uh, a decline in the number of tenure track faculty and increase in reliance on part time. So, is there some way that we can th- re- reverse this? I mean, what what what's the strategy here? That's a wonderful question, Peter. And first, you mentioned the word neoliberal, and a lot of this pipeline in industrial language goes back to Milton Friedman, who you know is the father of neoliberal economics. And in a chapter in his book, Capitalism and Freedom, uh, it's in the 50s, there's a government and uh, schooling chapter, and a lot of the language you see there about productivity, efficiency, consumers, that, that they're not students but consumers, that comes from that chapter, and you'll hear it today. And that used to be on the fringes, and now it's normal. So to me, as a language teacher, the first step is to recognize when this language is being used and to call it out and to resist it and to not use it and then to reframe the conversation, to use different language that does not reflect this business mentality. And from there, we can begin to reclaim the conversation. So again, to recognize when you're using this language and not to use it, to resist using that language, to call it out, to reframe it and use different phrases that are more natural to an educational environment. And then from that point, we can really begin looking at a new vision of education that's more democratic and humane and not just a pipeline. We're talking to Adam Bessie, a professor of English at Northern California Community Colleges. Let's move over to Victor Garland. He's Professor Emeritus in Economics from Sonoma State University. You were there 37 years. That was a few years back. You were president of the uh, union there for over a decade. Victor, tell us about your history and your recollections of, of Sonoma State and the transitions that you've seen happen there and the fee fight that happened in 1996. Thanks very much, Peter. Most people listening to this program will be aware of Mario Savio's role in the free speech movement, and you remember his famous speech in which the last phrase is, we're not raw material, we're human beings. That's a very important and memorable uh, speech of Mario's and indicates that he, he and the movement that he led was aware of this process in 1964 that uh, Adam has so ably uh, just described. But uh, he had another uh, career, a subsequent career at Sonoma State University. Uh, In 1995, after he'd been teaching at Sonoma State for a number of years, he was invited by the Sonoma County ACLU to give their keynote address. And he used that opportunity to launch an organization called the Campus Community for Human Rights and Social Justice, uh, which um, he hoped would be successful in defeating what eventually became Proposition 209, a proposition which unfortunately the voters in California enacted, which uh, for all intents and purposes killed affirmative action and equal opportunity employment programs uh, in the state of California for state employees and for students. He was also increasingly concerned about the costs of higher education. Mario, as you know, was a a person who believed that the educational system should be used as a social equalizer. And he also, of course, believed that everyone was entitled to the humanizing uh, aspects and influence of uh, higher education. But in the fall of 1996, the Sonoma State University administration proposed a, an additional fee of $300 on top of the already high tuition. And uh, CSU rules, California State University rules at that time, required that there be a student referendum, uh, a fair student referendum in which the university would be neutral with respect to its outcome. Of course, this didn't happen. The university produced a one-sided voters pamphlet. Faculty were pressured into urging their students to vote yes, and the administration actively campaigned among student leaders with the purpose of getting them to support this fee. Uh, Mario associated himself with a student group, the League of Student Voters, and it was organized to oppose this fee. He was a leader, Mario was the leader of a group of 
faculty members who assisted the league. It was essentially a student-run operation, and Mario, as was characteristic of himself, refused to take the credit or uh, allow himself to become a celebrity in the context of that struggle. The major substantive objection to the fee was, of course, that it would uh, increase the cost of higher education at Sonoma State, making it more difficult, uh, even more difficult than it w already was for low-income students and students of color to attend Sonoma State University. Mario asked that the university postpone the election until such time as the students could be adequately informed of its consequences. But when the university refused, Mario filed a lawsuit in the Sonoma County Superior Court to delay the vote. And it was while Mario was preparing the documents for his lawyer in connection with this lawsuit that he had the heart attack which ended his life. As it turned out, the fee was defeated by a 58% majority of the students, largely as a result of Mario's and the League of Student Voters' efforts to reach all the students with the facts about the fee and its impact. This was Mario's last political effort, and it was motivated by a desire to keep higher education affordable and to maintain the vision of the master plan for higher education in California. This period of Mario's life is ably described in Robert Cohn's excellent biography of Mario called Freedom's Orator. A recent proposal by the administration of Sonoma State to impose now a $500 annual fee on top of its already high tuition was a replay of the situation in 1996. The good news is that on February 19th, the administration withdrew this proposal in the face of mounting student opposition, opposition that was supported by faculty and community leaders who pledged never to give the university any money to enhance its endowment. It's an amazing story, not only historically, but contemporary in terms of what the we're going to have some students on later in the program that describe what happened at Sonoma State. But this is a what's this called is this success fee. We've seen other campuses succeed in doing this. San Marcos got a five hundred dollar fee. The East Bay did one. Uh, San Bernardino did one. And it's sort of this kind of creeping, escalating cost that presidents on campuses can impose on their students. They no longer have to have a vote. So comment on that. We'll go back to Victor, and then we're going to wrap up this segment. So success success is a word you can't be against. For example, success fee. Who's against the success fee? That, that means you're for failure, right? You want your students to fail. In California, we have uh, just passed the California Community College Success Act. Again, who can be against that, right? Who could be against it, right? The larger context here that Victor brought up so ably is that it's community versus consumer. If we look at education as a consumer phenomenon, that education is a business, then charging more fees makes a lot of sense because education is a product to be purchased. If, however, education is a community enterprise, then fees don't make any sense, especially for those of us, our students, who are most vulnerable and most likely to be knocked out. And that's my worry with these success fees and these success acts, is that success will come at the cost of our most vulnerable students. On paper, we'll look much better, right? But in reality, we'll look, our test scores and everything will look better because we've cut out those students that are least likely to succeed. A uh, main concern of Mario was bringing students who are less likely to succeed into the system of higher education. He, w he was well aware, as we all are here, that students who grow up with privilege are the ones who succeed in higher education, and those who lack privilege are those who are ten uh, tend to fail. And it's those students whom people like us around this table are most concerned with. You're listening to the Project Censored Show. I'm Andy Lee Roth in studio with co-host Peter Phillips. We've been hearing from Adam Bessie, uh, professor of English at Diablo Valley College and author of This School is Not a Pipe, which is available online at truthout.org. And we've also been hearing from Professor Emeritus of Economics at Sonoma State University, Victor Garland. We're going to take a short musical break. When we come back, stay with us. We'll be digging deeper into the efforts to pro impose a success fee, this Orwellian language, at Sonoma State University and how students and faculty successfully organized to shut down that proposal down. Stay with us. When 
I say the hungry should have food. I speak for many when I say no one should have seven homes. While some don't have any, though I may find myself stranded in some strange place with not but a vapid stare. I remember the world that I know. the time for the rich it will come let me count the ways victories are hits of the future Havana, Caracas, Chiapas Buenos Aires how many people are wanting and waiting and fighting for their share they hide in their ivory tower We are everywhere Religions and prisons and races Borders and nations FBI agents and congressmen And corporate radio stations They try to keep us apart But we find each other Every bomb that they drop, every home they destroy, every land they invade, comes a new generation from under the rubble saying, we are not afraid. They will pretend we are few, but with each child that a billion mothers bear, comes the next demonstration. We are everywhere. We are everywhere. We are everywhere. Welcome back to the Project Censored Show. I'm Andy Lee Roth in studio with co-host Peter Phillips. That was Dave Rovix singing We Are Everywhere, and he will be playing tomorrow night, Saturday, March 1st, 7 p.m., in a concert sponsored by the San Francisco Living Wage Coalition. That's, again, Dave Rovix tomorrow night, Saturday, 7 p.m., at the Redstone Labor Temple, 2940 16th Street in San Francisco. We've been talking about education reform, the perils of education reform, the privatization of education, the standardization of education, the technicalization of public education, and of course the efforts to fight back. We're joined now by two students from Sonoma State University who played pivotal roles in the su successful effort to oppose President Ruben Armagnana's uh, so-called success fee that would have increased student tuitions by as much as $500 or 28% over a school year. Uh, so we're joined by Macy McClung and Patricia Miraz. Macy and Patricia, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you for having us here. Both Macy and Patricia are sociology majors at Sonoma State University, and they are officers and members of the sociology club, which helped organize against the proposed $500 fee increase. Four weeks ago, the SSU president announced the discussion of a new fee for all students next year that would raise an additional $4.2 million out of all the 9,000 students' pockets from their families and themselves. Students and faculty organized against the fee, and over 1,250 sent emails to the president pledging to never donate to Sonoma State if the fee was implemented. On February 19th, President Ruben Armagnana announced he was no longer pursuing an academic success fee at Sonoma State, and he informed the student body of his decision via an email. He attributed it partly to vocal resistance by students who had been circulating a protest position and sending him emails. So, uh, Patricia and Macy, welcome. Tell us why you were opposed to the fee. Patricia, you want to start? I am opposed to the fee because college is already too expensive. 
a lot of my friends are living off of their student loans, and that has to last them the whole year. Aside from that, I'm a, I'm a single mother of three kids, and I go to public school because I can't afford to go to private school. And tuition now is running close to 8000 at Sonoma State. Well, they don't call it tuition. They call it fees. Yeah. We're still tuition-free. It just costs you a lot of money to go. Macy, tell us, tell us about yourself. Well, I'm a first-year transfer to... Um, Sonoma State, I came over from the San Jose Junior College where, in comparison, school is extremely, you know, inexpensive. And I came over to Sonoma State, and they have these ridiculous unit caps and these different flat fees depending on how many units you take. And then they want to add all these different types of fees on top of the students, which, in my opinion, it's public education. It should not have that, you know, disparity in it where you have to have different classes of people being segregated by how much money you make. You know, if you increase those fees, guess who you're cutting out? Not the people who can afford it and whose parents are paying for it or, you know, they're just lucky enough in that position to have it, but you're cutting out the people who are economically disadvantaged in comparison. And schools should not have that limited access. It should have an all-encompassing access. It, like previously, it should be an equalizer. That's really important, really important point. The public universities in the state of California were set up to be free for the upper third of the students coming out of high school. And the community college were set and open for anybody. And there was no fee costs at all. And now we're increasingly seeing these high expensive costs and then limited access to classes. Uh, how I was hearing from a lot of students on campus how they couldn't get the classes. How did it work for, for you, Patricia? I had to email a lot of my professors and tell them, like, look, I'm a senior, this is my last semester, and just basically tell them my situation. It's like, you have to sell yourself to see if you can get in. <laughs> um, you know, I guess whoever's story is better. Um, I, I honestly don't know, like, how they pick and choose, but I had to email most of the people that I was um, trying to get into their classes. So. And Macy, what, what, how'd this semester go for you? Uh, well, I kind of have like a bone to pick with Sonoma State for this specific instance because I'm a transfer student from the JC. We had to take this in orientation where they evaluated all our paperwork work, and they had to have everything laid out for us saying, if you have this, you can take this, and this is how much time you should have before you get out. Well, they lost my paperwork, and during orientation, I had nothing to go off from. I lost my priority because they didn't evaluate my lost paperwork, so I had to kind of do some groundwork and make up for that. I got little to no priority. I'm only enrolled in two classes at Sonoma State, and I'm paying the like top amount of fees, which is the $3,800, $700 mark there, just to take eight units. And it's ridiculous because it's not my fault. It's strictly administration and all these things that have put me at a disadvantage in the long run, and it's making me pay more money in the long run. And I'm not the only student. So many people are affected by this and I thought well I must be a special case I was just the one who got lost in the system you know but no I'm talking to everybody people are struggling to find units and struggling to find classes and even when they do find those teachers and professors who want to let them in they get denied by administration or deans because we just don't have the room for you yet if you kept that window of opportunity open and everyone drops those classes within the first two, couple weeks you could add people into those classes but instead you have not full classes with people who can't get into them because of certain deadlines and the system that's in place. And it's just really messed up. It's not what education should be. You're listening to the Project Censored show. I'm Andy Lee Roth of Project Censored um, in studio with my co-host and colleague, Peter Phillips. And we're hearing from Macy McClung and Patricia Miraz, students at Sonoma State University who were part of the successful campaign against the proposed success fee so we've been hearing some about the challenges and problems that students at Sonoma State University are facing. And, of course, those are not necessarily unique to that campus alone. Uh, but I want to turn now, uh, Patricia and Macy, to talk about uh, some of the solutions and some of the, the good news coming out of this particular story. In particular, of course, uh, as, as was announced on the 19th of the month, uh, Armagnana, President Armagnana of Sonoma State, announcing that they would not at this time be pursuing the extra fees. That announcement included an acknowledgement that student protests had been a serious factor in that decision. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about how the campaign against the fees developed and especially what were some of the successful strategies that you employed to let the administration know that this was not successful. Uh, Macy, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, 
Well, I just kind of jumped in with sociology club right when I got, got in there. I knew I had to be involved in something. Um, and it was kind of brought to us all by Peter. We no no one had any idea what was going on. For some reason, like not even the Associated Student Senate knew what was going on. They were playing like don't shoot the messenger because, you know, the student population was angry, wanted answers from them, but at the same time administration and other officials were not giving them any information and it was kinda all it was pretty disorganized at the beginning because no one knew what was going on, no one knew the facts. Eventually Lots of student organizations like Sociology Club, BSU, and SQA, they all organized, and they knew directly, like, no one in the right mind, especially students, are going to support this fee that is just basically one big marketing scheme to get your money. And just to clarify yeah. for our, our audience, uh, BSU and SQA are? BSU is Black Student Union, and SQA is? Students for Quality Education. Yeah. SQA, okay, excuse sorry. me. And Patricia, so clearly this wasn't, uh, you know, as the administration, and particularly President Armagnano, were seeking to impose this fee, as Macy suggests, that process didn't really become open to participation by f- students on campus until there was organized until, uh, yeah. uh, protest against it, right? Yeah. Until Social Club officially took a stance and said, We're, we oppose the fee and let everyone know, then all of a sudden there was like the AS, the Associated Students, started putting together these um, meet and, like meetups, these meetings where students can talk about um, how they felt about the fee. But that wasn't something that happened right away. And it wasn't until after we said we opposed the fee. So I like to believe, which <laughs> I don't know how you feel, Macy, but when we decided like that we we're going to publicly oppose it, then they said, oh, you guys better do something. It was almost like a conquer, uh, divide and conquer type scenario by the administration yeah right? it, it kind of was it was just i don't know it for my view it was just so disconnected but you never know like the higher up what they see because you're not like yeah. you know sitting in the room with them when they make such decisions so may i bet you that was some sort of factor you know yeah. like when your constituents on some level move in one direction you have to kind of see what's happening so yeah. like I, it makes sense to me students in the prior semester had surveyed 300 students arbitrary students on campus is a convenience sample, um, which when done that way is a 90% accuracy of what the entire student body felt. Mm -hmm. And we were seeing people at that time say 8% said they would have to drop out a $500 increase and, and three or 4,000 students were unsure if they could stay. If there was that much of an increase, it was obvious to us that there was clearly opposition. So when the social club decided that they were going to officially oppose this fee. That was step one. And then over the next weekend, faculty jumped in, and each individual faculty members contributed $25, $50 to build a website. And the name of it was uh, SSU Freedom from Fees. Mm -hmm. And that website became the place where students could go online and, and petition and protest and, and an email would be sent to the president of the university. Within five days, 1,250 emails had been sent. They, was going, they were going out at the rate of 25 an hour. And I think it, it became quite clear that uh, a vast majority of the students, uh, very similar to what happened in 1996, were opposed to this fee, and it was expensive enough, enough to go now. Mm-hmm. The, I- I, I want to ask uh, Andy Andy Roth here, uh, and I want to ask our guests, uh, Macy McLoone and Patricia Miraz, students at Sonoma State University, where students coordinating and aligning with faculty and staff just defeated this uh, proposed success fee. I want to ask, do you think that the strategies that you used at Sonoma State could be adapted to other campuses if such fees were proposed? Um, or or, or, or was, were the conditions here so unique that this case isn't kind of extendable? Uh, Patricia, do you want to respond first? I think so, because... Um if you hit them where it hurts in the pockets, then that's you know that's what that's what sends the message, right? So, I think we just did what they were trying to do to us, and I think if they if they did use that and at, on other campuses, it would definitely work. Mm-hmm. And Macy, are there pre- specific strategies that you think really were the key here? I think the organizing, the outspokenness, and the um, specifically on the last day, what I noticed where everyone, even like the lay person, was aware of lots of chalking because, you know, that's one thing that you can't really crack down on a university because I don't know why, but you just can't. So any way that you can get your freedom of speech out there is a great way to do it. And just kind of touch back on what you said before about is it a unique situation? I'm going to say absolutely not. This has happened at so many CSUs all over um, the state. And what was unique about our situ- situation is that we did not adopt the fee. And 
even scary is that what probably would have happened is that they would not have gone to the student vote because they don't have to. You know, board of trustees says they don't have to. And historically speaking, all the other CSUs, they never went to the student vote. They did the um, alternative advising or whatever they had to do and so it's just scary having something that directly affects you out of your hands and i feel like that if anything was a giant motivating factor for the students at sonoma state and the faculty this is the project censored show and we're talking about uh the privatization of education and the increasing cost of education and how that affects students we're in studio with two students who have been so successful in the uh, campaign uh, against the imposition of a success fee at Sonoma State University. And that has, in fact, uh, attracted uh, attention from the media. The Press Democrat on February 21st reports that in the face of outcry, Sonoma State University fee plan is cut. And uh, one of the quotes in this article that I think is worth looking at and talking about and maybe even deconstructing a little bit is from President Armagnana, explaining that uh, he says, quote, we hear the concern raised by students about the extra financial burden of the fee. We have decided, therefore, not to pursue the academic success fee at this time. And I think that's an important dimension. But then the quote continues. People don't want to pay more. That's it. Armagnana said in an interview. The quote continues and ends. They were not willing to consider the return on their investment. And what strikes me about that last bit of President Armagnana's quotation is the portrayal basically then of students as irrational economic actors. You're acting out of ignorance or error. You don't really understand how valuable this fee with the value that this fee would have added to your education. And Patricia, I see you rolling your eyes a little bit. Do you want to respond there? Because it's more than just the fee. Like to me, this five hundred dollar fee was the 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 door that would open all other fees and and narrow the gap for diversity at Sonoma State, which is slim to none. Period. And uh, you know, not only at Sonoma State, but for people like me, I grew up. I'm not from Sonoma County. I grew up in Boyle Heights, Los Angeles. For people who grew up in neighborhoods like mine, our only way out, our only people who are in oppression, your only way out is education. This is our one avenue, and and now because they're treating it as a for-profit business, we won't have that outlet. You know, and that's what that's what frustrates me, because it's more than this $500 fee. It's more than that. You know, it's about people moving forward and and stopping you know, um, stopping the progress. That's what it's about to me. Well, we really thank you both for coming in. Uh, it's a marvelous victory to know that students. Uh, just using social internet can turn around what had been imp- an imposed, uh, planning to impose $500 fee on all the students there. And the students really stood up and said, we're not going to ever donate to this campus if you make us pay this fee. That's, that's an amazing success story, and we're very proud of you to have you here. This is the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Andy Lee Roth in studio with Peter Phillips. Mickey Huff will be back next week. On today's program, we've been talking about the rising costs of higher education in the United States and how students at one California campus, Sonoma State University, organized to defeat a new $500 fee proposed by the administration there. We'll close out today's program with an excerpt from an education show that we did last year. One of our stories in Censored 2013, Dispatches from the Media Revolution, was about GERM warfare, where GERM is an acronym that stands for the Global Education Reform Movement. We looked at how privatization and other neoliberal policies are being depicted in corporate media as, quote, education reform, end quote. One of today's guests, Adam Bessie of Diablo Valley College, was also on that program. And the second guest that day was Ken Burroughs of San Francisco State University. They spoke with Mickey Huff. Here's an excerpt of that conversation. Adam, let's start the conversation. You go on in the uh, Censor 2013 book in your germ warfare chapter. You, you talk about this global education reform movement. You expose it as an epidemic in the civil rights issue of our generation, essentially. And so t- talk a little bit about that and also the ironic genesis of germ. Yeah. These set of reforms, though, have been very effectively packaged using a social justice narrative. This is education reform. So when you hear, we need to reform our schools, our schools need to be better, this is what we're talking about, implementation of high-stakes standardized testing, right? And 
where this comes from, the genesis, as you said, of germ, is interestingly not from progressive camps at all. Even though they've adopted that language, it comes from a man you may be familiar with named Milton Friedman, who was Ronald Reagan's uh, economic advisor and is, invented the school voucher and invented a lot of the neoliberal capitalist strategies that have become, become to known as the shock doctrine by Naomi Klein. And so the, the fascinating thing is Friedman, whose policy is that government should have as little role in education as possible. Education should basically be a service provided by private enterprise and government should basically regulate. That's about it. Has now, 50 years later, 50 years later, has now been framed in this sort of progressive language. So you hear things like every child deserves and every zip code deserves an education. You hear Mitt Romney saying things like education is a civil rights issue of our generation. And yet the policies they're actually talking about are these standardized tests and are these privatizing policies created by Milton Friedman. Yeah, and that, that's certainly the irony when you see um, many, uh, certainly Democrats, Barack Obama, Arne Duncan, Michelle Rhee, even public television seemingly has been infected with this germ. We're speaking with Adam Bessie, professor of English at Diablo Valley College, contributor to Censored 2013, a chapter called Germ Warfare, also author of The Disaster Capitalism Curriculum, a comic with Dan Archer. We're joined on the phone also. Let's bring Ken Burroughs in from San Francisco State University, Holistic Health Center, contributor to Project Censored. Ken, you want to talk a little bit about new pathways in education. So let, let's start talking about, you know, Adam has been laying out what some of the issues are. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's let's hear from you. Where should we be? What what should we be doing, do you think, uh, in your estimation of uh, in all your experience over the years as an educator? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's a great question. It's a question we, we're starting to hold here in a very, very earnest way on our campus. Um, we feel that education really isn't serving students, uh, in, in at least not the 21st century that we've entered. Um, in fact, the chapter we just wrote for the uh, new Project Censored book is on the seven challenges we see that's facing humanity that education needs to be uh, directed to. So I, I have the question, what, what life skills um, are, should student, students have in their toolbox on graduation? And what would be the role of educators and public intellectuals in this time when the American culture is so is struggling so deeply? George Lucas just sold the rights to his Star Wars stories to, uh, to Disney and has taken this wealth and is basically putting it into education. He feels we need to have a more engaged educational process, which he feels this new this new form of education is the key to, to the very survival of the human race, in his words. So instead of an assembly line education of teaching to the test, and really, uh, which is failing our society and certainly our students, and really, so students are often just marking time learning what they, quote, should be learning, leaving out their own individual needs and abilities. Uh, Lucas, among others, is suggesting that uh, education for the 21st century look very different. Um, we need to be focusing on the arts in particular. And the arts bring us um, some things that the sciences can't. And we often, when we think of education, we think of um, all the, the STEM series, the science, technology, engineering, and math. And that isn't really preparing us for the complexity of how to think differently. Um, many of my students are taking courses. They're they're just um, they're sort of lost. They they don't know really what they want yet. Uh, they're being sort of um, to some degree force fed information and uh, run through this assembly line so they can graduate quickly because there's so many students in the pipeline. But humanity's entered this time of global crisis both economically, socially, environmentally. So we need somehow this great quote by Teilhard de Chardin that the future belongs to those that can give the next generation good reason to hope. And we've not necessarily, we're not really doing that well with students. The whole complex nature of today's challenges requires us to explore more comprehensive ways of thinking and, and living. Oh, Ken Burroughs. Um, Ken Burroughs is a contributor to Censored 2013, professor at San Francisco State University, and contributed 
again, to the 2013 book with Michael Nagler, uh, The Creative Tension of the Emerging Future, Facing the Seven Challenges of Humanity. And in there, uh, Ken talks a little bit more about that. Adam Bessie, mm-hmm. uh, let's briefly go back to you on the matter of, you heard what Ken Burroughs was just saying um, about how we we need to be doing things differently. And there are some, mm-hmm. some signs here that things are changing in Seattle recently. Yeah. Teachers were saying no to standardized testing. Could, can you talk to us a little bit about some of these developments? Yeah, and I, I, I want to jump off one point and then come to that. I, I, there is definitely resistance to this assembly line or Model T, as you might call it, education. And Seattle is the forefront of that. In fact, Garfield High School, uh, the teachers have refused to implement the MAP standardized test directly against the superintendent's orders. And ironically, uh, Garfield High School is where Jimi Hendrix went to high school, so it's a very appropriate site of resistance. But just real quickly beyond that, Ken said something interesting about things being different. As somebody that's not, as a public that you're listening, you're not fully immersed in this debate as we are, it's hard to tell what's different and what's being packaged differently. So if I may just jump off on a debate I had with John Morrow of PBS about this assembly line education. This was on the news hour. This was on the PBS news hour. And John Morrow, who's a veteran reporter, went to the rocket ship charter school, which is in uh, the South Bay of San Francisco. And they've been heavily promoted as being very innovative. And they said a lot of the same things you'd hear Ken say. We have 21st century kids. We need 21st century skills. Education needs to be different. It all sounds wonderful. And I think all of us agree with it. I think education needs to be different. That's what we're here. That's what we're talking. We don't want things to be the same. We want it to be better. However, when you look into this school, two hours of instruction a day, this is for elementary school children, two hours of instruction a day are on a computer two hours a day on a, a video game which teaches math. Now, that is being framed as being innovative. And by doing that, they're able to hire less teachers. All right, so two hours a day, the, the kids are sitting and doing something different. But the reality is all of that is done in service of math and reading. So while this is an innovative-looking method, the end goal is not innovative, which is to do better on standardized tests. And indeed, this school has done better on standardized tests. But they do not have art. They do not have drama. They do not have anything. These are small children. So it's really hard to distinguish what actual innovation is, what's different in a good way, and what's different just by appearance. And that was an excerpt from a 2013 Project Censored show on education, where Mickey Huff spoke with Adam Bessey and Ken Burroughs. You're listening to the Project Censored Show on the Morning Mix, originating at KPFA Studios in Berkeley, California. For archives of our show, visit www.projectcensored.org and keep tabs and like us on Facebook at Project Censored. Thanks to our producer, Anthony Fess and Kristen Thomas on the board. You are tuned to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB, in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. Up next will be Democracy Now! We'd like to remind everyone, too, that on February 28th tonight, there's a talk and a film screening from 6 to 9 p.m. at the Mount Diablo Peace and Justice Center in Walnut Creek. Mickey, Andy, and I will be there, and we'll be showing the film Project Censored the movie. KPFA Pacifica Radio proudly present 12 hours of special programming in celebration of International Women's Day, Saturday, March 8th, beginning at 8 a.m. We will honor the experiences, struggles, triumphs, and tribulations of women all over the world through music, extraordinary storytelling, insightful and thought-provoking interviews, commentaries, and much more. That's Saturday, March 8th, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on KPFA 94.1 FM and online at kpfa.org. And I don't want to go through another heartbreak. Still, I know why it's a lot. Fernando Gonzalez. One of the Cuban Five is scheduled to be released from U.S. prison later this month. You are invited to join Canadian author Stephen Kimber on Sunday, March 2nd at 5.30 p.m. when he discusses his new book, 
Rock, What Lies Across the Water, The Real Story of the Cuban Five at La Peña Cultural Center, 3105 Shadok Avenue in Berkeley. This event is wheelchair accessible and is a benefit for the International Committee for the Freedom of the Cuban Five. For more information, call 510-219-0092 or visit www.lapeña.org. Listening to KPFA 94.1 FM in Berkeley, KPFB 89.3 FM in Berkeley, and KFCF 88.1 FM in Fresno, or streaming at KPFB.